Good morning. Could you tell us your name, please, and spell your last name for the court reporter? My name is Kyle DeVries, D-E-V-R-I-E-S. How are you employed, sir? I'm employed through the Wisconsin Department of Transportation Division of State Patrol. And do you have any specific assignments with the State Patrol? I do. Currently, I'm assigned to our Technical Reconstruction Unit. And what is the Technical Reconstruction Unit? Um, it is a group of individuals um, with specialized skills and advanced training um, that um, work with crash reconstruction and crime scene documentation. All right. And how long have you been assigned to that unit? Uh, about three and a half years. You may. Mr. Breeze, I've shown you what has been marked for identification as exhibit number 279. Could you tell me what that document is? This document is a curriculum vitae. It summarizes my crash reconstruction related education and instructor experiences. And let's just hit some of the highlights. Uh, can you start with when you first started working in the technical reconstruction unit, what type of training did you receive to become involved in that unit? Um, it starts with um, basic crash investigation, technical crash investigation, advanced crash investigation. Could you just slow down just Sorry. a little bit? I... Um, there, there's a lot to go through. Um, um, crash reconstruction itself, um, and then there's additional specialties through that. There's um, forensic mapping, there's um, um, computer-aided drawing, there's specific um, caveats in crash reconstruction to um, motorcycle or commercial motor vehicles. Um, and it's, a, it's an extensive list of training that is continuously ongoing. All right. And do you have ongoing training as you go through uh, or as you continue to work in the technical reconstruction unit? That is correct. What type of ongoing training do you have? Um, what uh, could be whatever comes up and then it's available. Um, anything to further our education um, in regards to any certain aspects, whether it's again with human factors or forensic mapping, differences, um, new technology that comes to light um, in the use of that as well. Right. And uh, Mr. DeVries, uh, as far as your uh, work, in, in addition to receiving training, do you, are you also involved in teaching? That is correct. I'm also an instructor. I teach um, our state patrol cadets as well as other law enforcement agencies and technical reconstruction as well as forensic mapping. All right. And when you, uh, in, in this case, were you asked to assist in some way? I was. And uh, by the way, Your Honor, at this point, I'd move the admission of Exhibit 279. Any objection to 279? No, we agree. Okay. 279 will be received. Now, were you asked to assist in some way in the investigation in the matter that we're here in court for today? Correct. Um, I received a phone call from Sergeant Richard Day from the Dunn County Sheriff's Office. Um, he informed me that they were investigating a death that occurred in their county. Um, he informed me that um, the Wisconsin State Crime Lab was also en route to assist with their investigation, and they were requesting the Technical Reconstruction Unit to assist in forensically documenting or mapping out the, the scene. And uh, so that was essentially your involvement is to do forensic mapping? That is correct. All right. Let's talk a little bit about forensic mapping. How do you do forensic mapping? Um, there are several different ways, um, generally through the use of technology, um, whether that be survey grade instruments um, such as total stations, um, or 3D scanners. Sometimes it's even it goes to simple hand measurements. All right. In this case, what methods did you use to uh, map the scene? Um, I used two methods. Um, the first being a, a uh, Trimble R10 total station. Um, it is a, operates off the uh, GNSS survey. It's kind of like GPS, but it's a global navigation um, satellite system. Um, it takes highly accurate measurements. Um, and we can use those measurements, they're collected in a data collector, and we can use those measurements in a computer drawing program to um, create scale, scale diagrams. All right, 
And you said you used the second method? Correct. Second method, we used a 3D scanner, a Ferro Focus 3, um, XT3D or 330. Sorry. A Ferro Focus 330 laser scanner. Um, it's a laser scanner um, and it takes hundreds of thousands of points um, in a 360 degree direction. Um, those points are collected and stored into a point cloud and we can use those in a 3D um, computer software to um, render um, an image or um, put in a program so that you can see what, um, what was taken and you can also take measurements from that 3D as well. And do these then render you uh, accurate uh, images of your scene and what is at the scene? Correct. The scanner, while, while it's taking measurements, it takes a, a second round. It also takes um, photographs and overlays them with the measurements. <coughs> so um, when you put the point cloud data in the computer, it attaches the images to the point cloud data so you can see and move around through um, the scene itself. And, and so when you're working from the program, it, does it let you essentially just step into there and be able to see what you would see if you were actually there at that time? Basically, yes. All right. And can you then, with that information, while you're using the program and viewing the scene, can you take measurements to find out how far certain things are from other things? Yes, you can. And how do you do that? Um, through a function in the software. Um, again, all the data points that are in there are to scale. Again, I can, I can click on a point, click on another point, and I will, it will give me the exact distance. All right. Now, uh, Besides mapping of scenes like this, what other types of work do you have to do or do you do as part of the technical reconstruction unit? Um, I guess I'm not sure what you're getting at other than as far as, you know. Um, do you do accident reconstructions as well? Yes. And is that the same technology and systems that you're talking about here? Yes, we use the same systems for that. Now in this case, uh, you uh, create a number of diagrams, is that correct? That is correct. Right. I'm just going to stay up here for a moment, uh, showing you what has been marked for identification as exhibit number 282. Can you tell me what that is? Um, that would be a diagram of basically all of the scene that I collected, including in that diagram are general measurements of distance. And I'm sorry, I don't distance. And that would include basically the, uh, the location where the uh, defendant's vehicle was found uh, and then over to the Don Sippel residence? Correct. Your Honor, I move the admission of Exhibit 282, ask to publish it to the jury, and then I'm going to ask some more questions about it. Agreed. Any, any objection? No objection? No objection. All right. Exhibit uh, 282 will be received. Can I get up and move, or is there a place Your Honor would suggest that I be so that I can see what's going on? I'm not. Sure. So, Trooper, why don't you step on down? Hang on just a moment. Uh, <coughs> what do you have in mind, Mr. Nelson? Can we either, if we... Put that back about five feet. I think I can see it from here. All right, we have room. Let's move it back. And... How's that? Oh, that's great. Thank All you. Right. And okay. ladies and gentlemen, jury, jury, are you able to okay. see it? Okay. All right. The trooper, why don't you step on down, and why don't you explain for us a little bit about what we're seeing here? Uh, start at the uh, bottom right corner of that exhibit. What what is that area? Okay. In the bottom right corner here, I'm actually going to move to this side. Um, there is a, a trailer and a vehicle that was located off of a, uh, an entrance from, the, from 430th Avenue. Um, that's what we see here. There are some tire marks that follow behind the vehicle. Um, down this road here, this is actual 430th Avenue. Um, this would be um, the top of the diagram is facing north. So going to um, the west, um, we have several different 
uh, driveway entrances labeled by addresses, um, and the distances from basically the car to the road and the road to the far road. All right. And so what is the distance then from uh, the uh, car to 430th Avenue? It's approximately 658 feet. All right. And the distance then from uh, the uh, end of the road to the uh, Donald Sippel residence, uh, which I believe is identified as E7614. Right. And that distance is displayed here is approximately 1,226 feet. So in uh, percent of a, a mile or a, a amount of a mile, how far is that total distance? It's approximately 0.35 miles. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have as far as that one. Why don't you come on back? We're going to move to the if next. If it's helpful, we don't object to any of these. You can just put them up and okay. go as Great. quickly as you can it, or as you want. Sure. Then we're going to move at this point in time to our exhibits. Uh, Two eighty three through two eighty five. Okay. All right. Are those pre marked or? Yes, they are, Your Honor. Okay. Exhibits uh, two eighty three, two eighty four, and two eighty five will be received. Yeah. So, Trooper, I've got up here now Exhibit two eighty. I believe it is. Let me just make sure again. Yes. Can you explain what we're seeing on Exhibit 283? Um, exhibit 283 is uh, more of a snapshot of the entire diagram. Um, in this, there were certain things that were identified by investigators. Um, here we found that there were three pieces of evidence that was located. Um, the circle with the E and the letter, the E stands for evidence. Um, and then the alpha character A, B, and C correspond to whatever type of evidence that was found and would be on that evidence log. Right. And so when law enforcement found the evidence, they had you come out and actually map the locations of those pieces of evidence? That is correct. All right. And uh, what was evidence marker that is labeled C? What was that as you understand it? I believe that was part of a cell phone. Okay. And how about evidence marker A? I believe that was also another part of a cell phone. All right. And evidence marker B? I believe that was a knife. Okay. All right. And uh, so the knife was found at the location that uh, the arrow is pointed to? Correct. It would be right here, um, just off the shoulder of the, of the roadway. And just before the driveway to the Donald Sippel residence? Correct. All right. Thank you. Let's move to exhibit two eighty four. What are we looking at on exhibit two eighty four? Um, exhibit two eighty four again is a, a blown up area of the entire. Um, Seen that you had seen before. However, this we're focusing on the roadway that came south from 430th Avenue. In this particular uh, diagram, a footpath was noted um, in the roadway itself. Um, so that's where it was highlighted here. And again, two additional um, evidence markers was located by investigators. Um, the difference here with these ones being numerical numbers is that they were found by a different agency. All right, those were found by the crime lab? Correct. All right, and the other ones, the letter ones were found by Dunn County Sheriff's officers? That is correct. All right, and as you understand it, evidence markers one and two were what? I believe they were foot cast impressions. All right. Finally, uh, exhibit 285. I'm not going to try to ask you what each one of these are. We'll cover that with the next witness. Uh, but can you explain what Exhibit 285 is? Sure. Um, exhibit 285 is a basically a blown-up version of where the vehicle and a trailer was located. Um, again, this would be south of the 430th Avenue. 
Um, the Wisconsin State Crime Lab had identified a, numerous items of evidence. Um, each evidence that's uh, labeled here corresponds with their evidence log. All right, and so th they have either tent markers uh, or uh, stick on labels marking what those evidence items are? Correct. And then you mapped out exactly where those were and created them this scale diagram? That is correct. All right, thank you. Let's move on then uh, to the other portion of your work, the 3D scanner portion. Uh, Trooper, I'm showing you what has been marked for identification as Exhibit 281. Can you tell me what that is? Um, it looks like a CD or DVD of the uh, Wisconsin State Patrol's scene recon, as it's what it's labeled here. All right. And that contains the work of your 3D scanner? Okay. Yes. All right. I move the admission of Exhibit 281 at this point, Your Honor. Any objection to 281? No, we agree. All right. Exhibit 281 will be received. All right, then, Trooper, what I'd like you to do, uh, you've got your computer hooked up over here. Uh, can you step to that? And I'd then like you to uh, bring up that program so that we can see what it looks like, and then I want to talk to you about some of the, the items in there. So what are we looking at here? So in the program, it's called Trimble Real Works. In this program, what we're currently seeing here is the point cloud um, of all the measurements that was originally taken from the 3D scanners. There were six scans that were completed around the vehicle, um, and that's what we're seeing right here. And what I'm going to do is open up the Scan Explorer, which allows it to incorporate the photographs um, that were taken with the scanner as well. So I, I see a, a yellow triangle there. Can you explain what that yellow triangle means? The yellow triangle are the setups where the scanner was located. Um, so it helps in here, I, um, as we can see down in the lower right-hand corner, you can see where each triangle was set up. That's where the scanner locations um, were around the vehicle. So there were multiple scanners there? Nope, just one scanner, just right, moved just around in six different times. Okay. And so this is looking from one of those points that you see those multiple triangles in the small diagram. Correct. In the lower right-hand corner, um, it's represented by the green triangle. That's okay. where we are currently are in the scene right now. Right. I didn't get that last part. Represented by the green triangle. That is where we are currently located um, in the scene. All right. And the green item to the side, is that that trailer we were talking about? Yes. All right. Uh, can you... With this, can you move around them to see different portions of it? Yes, I can. And how do you do that? Um, just by clicking the mouse um, and moving around through the scene. Okay. Let's go back, turn a little bit. I want you to go back to the trailer. So we're looking at the trailer uh, kind of flat on as best you can. Okay. There are two evidence markers on there, I believe. Correct? Yes. All right. Can you make... Uh, and Ms. Hoffmeyer will testify to what those are. Can you tell us uh, what the distance is between those two evidence markers on that trailer? Sure, I believe. And if there's a better <coughs> angle to get it from, that's fine. So because I can't see where the actual evidence is, I can see where the stickers are. Right. The measurements will be between, uh, from the center of the sticker to the center of the next sticker. And I apologize, what are those sticker numbers? Am I keep jumping ahead? Looks like 13 and 15. Uh, it's 14. <coughs> yeah, 13 and 14, counsel. 13 and 14. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> So that distance is approximately how far? Uh, uh, just over six feet of a, 
uh, away from each other. All right, great. Now, can you, from this angle, can you also then, uh, does this also show the vehicle itself? Yes, it does. All right, can you scroll around to the vehicle or turn around to the vehicle? And so it also shows then the various other evidence markers that are located out there? Correct. All right. All right. Now, uh, are you able to, as part of this, uh, can we see uh, the tracks of the vehicle and what happened with the vehicle as far as it getting stuck? Um, sure, there's some several different things that we can do here to see um, Kind of near the center, a little bit on the bottom, you can see some um, disturbed um, ground. Um, I can zoom in a little bit, which appears to be um, some type of tire mark um, from this angle. Um, I'm trying to see if I can see it from a different angle. So we kind of got washed out a little bit from our backlight that we had at the scene. There was virtually no light out there, so we had to bring in supplemental lighting. Okay. Is there a way that you can get it to see yes. it a little bit more clearly? Yes, we can turn off the pictures, uh, basically, and move it into a grayscale intensity so we can see that. I, I need to still have a touch on your sorry. Turn off the um, color into a grayscale. Um, and so now when, we're, when we have the color off, are you just looking at the what the laser scanner did itself versus with the pictures that it takes? It, it, it's a kind of a combination of both, but um, you're seeing more of the laser scanner than you are of the picture. And so what does it tell you and what does it show you as far as the tire marks at that point? Uh, from what I can see, it looks like it, at some point the vehicle um, came to a stop and it looks like it appeared it may have backed up. Okay. And uh, Trooper, if you can try to speak a little bit sure. more and maybe even move that microphone a little closer. I'll try to make sure I speak up loud enough and, and then if you can just use the microphone. Uh, and by the way, when when were you at the scene uh, on this? I believe I arrived at the scene. Um, it was shortly before 10 p.m. Um, and we worked there for a couple hours um, while the crime lab was processing the scene. Um, I had to wait for them to identify their evidence, um, and then we uh, took our scans. Um, so we're there um, well into the night. All right, and was that 10 p.m. on March 23rd? That is correct. Okay, all right. Uh, let's move to the area. Can you get us to the area where uh, most of the evidence markers were between the vehicle and the uh, trailer? Uh, what is that kind of black circle in, in there. What this this black circle here um, will be found at every scan station. It, it can't scan directly underneath it. Um, that's why there's a black circle here in this particular scan. If I were to move to a different scan, um, such as adjacent to it, um, the circle is gone, um, just because now it's, that data is now captured in this scan, not versus the other one. Okay. So again, same thing here for this scanner. It just can't see directly underneath the unit. All right. Let's go back to the one you were at just a minute ago. There we go. So this is showing us then in 3D and in uh, basically uh, scale that scene. Correct. All right. Can you zoom in on, uh, does it show any, are you able to observe any footprints in this scan? I believe near marker number five. All right. And it uh, appears that there were some blood in some of those footprints? Yes. Right. And uh, what type, uh, did you observe or did you have a chance to observe the, the uh, two types of footwear that, of the individuals that were there? I did not, other than the footwear that was already present there at the scene, which was identified. All right, and that was a pair of boots? I believe so, yes. And do you have that on your scans? Uh, there's one up here. Okay. Um, near evidence marker number four. All right. And I believe near evidence marker three. Okay, all right, great. Thank you. Right. Can you zoom back in on those uh, footprints? 
And are you able to get an approximate size of those footprints? Um, I can. Um, it, again, it's going to be an approximate size because I don't have the exact um, dimension of where each foot um, impression would start and stop. Okay. Um, Only go to there. Okay. All right. And again, you can't tell if these those are complete, if they start and stop, or anything. Correct. Like All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, All right. There also appears to be some other items there. Can you get us in on those a little bit closer? Any specific number? The, or uh, yeah. Uh, numbers. The, it appears there's kind of a gold or tan th sweater there or something on top of. Oh, here? There, yeah. Okay. All right. Great. And as you understand it, things were the way that at least law enforcement reported that nothing had been moved as of the time you're doing your scans? Correct. All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's go back again. Uh, can you get us to uh, any of the images that show us the tracks leading to that area? Um, sure. So again, um, from behind the vehicle, I'm going to go back into the grayscale so I can eliminate my backlighting. Um, we can see that there are some tire marks um, here that do run along um, back up towards um, 430th Avenue. Here we can see some tire marks leading up to the vehicle. And the tire marks there appear to be off of what is actually the road onto the grassy or area? That is correct. Right. And is that how they were, how you observed them at that location? Yes. Can we go back to, let's go to the uh, uh, other side of the vehicle. Uh, if we go back into color for now. All right. Can you just zoom in a little bit more on the vehicle itself? All right. Thank you. Just to give the jury that perspective. So that would be uh, with the, from the other side of the vehicle, which Correct, you're looking at the passenger side of the vehicle. Right. And now let's go back to the grayscale and look. let's take a look at the, right. uh, what is it, what are you seeing as far as the condition or, and the situation with the front tire there? Um, the front tire looks angled slightly to the left. Um, it appears to be not quite sunken down, but um, in a, there, there's some mud that's kind of squished up against the tire. Does it appear that there is uh, mud spatter on the vehicle itself? Um, yes, it appears. You can see on the, uh, along the passenger door here that there is um, some spatter. All right. Can we go to the front of the vehicle now? And stay on the grayscale. Uh, just zoom in there a little bit. Uh, do you observe and did you observe any actual footprints in the front of the vehicle? I did not. All right. Uh, did you look for them? Um, I don't specifically remember looking for them. Um, at the time that I was there, um, the temperatures were dropping. Um, the ground was getting harder. Okay. How was the ground when you first got there? Um, it was it still kind of semi-hard. Um, okay. This area here, the grassy area, um, was definitely much harder than the actual um, driveway or road itself. Okay, all right. Uh, but we did have footprints on the side of the vehicle. Correct. All right. Did you observe any footprints in the back of the vehicle? Um, can we go to the back and take yeah, a look? We'll I don't believe there was. Okay. Okay. Uh, can we 
look on the side of the vehicle here, the driver's side, uh, turn back, uh, does it appear that there is a covering of, over the, what would be that uh, rear side window there? Oh, right here, the, yeah. the vent window? Yes. Yeah. And let's go to the front window as well, the driver's side. Uh, is that the condition it appears, that, is the window down? It appears that the uh, window is just uh, slightly more than halfway down. Okay. Uh, let's go down, I want you to come down to the body there. Let's take a look. Uh, can you just zoom in on the scarf there? Thank you. And that would have been the condition of that scarf at the time that you arrived on that scene? Correct. All right. And finally, can we go to the other side of the vehicle? All right. Uh, and I want to zoom in on the front window again. Uh, can you put it on the... Does it, it might get... Yeah. And that window appears not to be down, or at least partially down, like the other window. Is that accurate? Yeah, it looks um, that the window is up or closed. Okay. Thank you. All right. I do not have any other questions for uh, Trooper DeVries, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Mr. Nelson? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. You were there uh, on the evening of March 23rd, 2018, is that right? That is correct. And you continued to be there into the early morning hours of March 24th, right? Correct. correct. You were there when it was dark up? Yes. At night? Yes. Um, you didn't go back when the sun was up to that scene to do these scans? No, that is correct. Um, and the reason is you just go out there as soon as they call you, right? Generally, yes. Okay. Um, the choice to whether to wait until there's daylight isn't necessarily your choice. It's the lead investigating agency's choice. Is that right? Correct. We initially um, scanned the vehicle at night when it was there. Um, after we completed our scanning and all of the evidence was collected, um, the vehicle, to my knowledge, was removed from the scene. You weren't there when the vehicle was removed? That's correct. You don't know how it was removed? Correct. You don't know if it was able to be moved without a tow truck? That is correct. Um, the, I just want to go through some of these uh, diagrams with you briefly. Sure. Exhibit 283, um, which is, you guys know that one? Yep. Uh, that you were asked questions about this, is that right? Asked questions from? You were asked questions by uh, the prosecutor. Yes, right? that is correct. Uh, and one of the questions was the driveway, correct? Yes. I'm correcting, this is not Mr. Sipple's driveway, agreed? That is not Mr. Sipple's driveway. Correct. Mr. Sipple's driveway uh, is farther down the road, correct? Correct. Mr. Sipple's driveway is... <coughs> Exhibit 282. In Exhibit 282, you're able to see Mr. Sipple's driveway farther down the roadway. Is that right? That is correct. So the footprints mentioned here by... Uh, 283 uh, are by a different driveway, correct? That is correct. Okay. And then on 285, the driveways as they're shown um, between Mr. Sipple, which is at E7614, and his daughter's house at E7616, it doesn't show them connecting on your map, agreed? Correct. But in reality, they do connect, is that right? 
I can't recall if they connect or not. All right. Would it refresh your memory to see a photo of that? Yes, it would. It appears to be like a aerial view of um, the area west of the initial scene. So you recognize it? Yes. Uh, and it appears to show uh, the residence E7616 in that photo, correct? Yes. And it appears to show a connection between uh, the two simple residences. Is yeah. that correct? So let me take another look. There's some trees in the way that look at kind of difficult to see. But it appears that the roads are connected, yes. Right. And just sometimes you just miss stuff, right? Um, actually, in this particular instance, um, it wasn't, I guess that other investigators said that um, it didn't appear to be necessary to map that part of the roadway. Okay. You don't know, uh, in, uh, you know that there was footprints, correct? Correct. And from footprints, I gather you inferred somebody was moving on their feet. Correct. Walking, running. Something. Some, some way up on two feet, correct? Correct. Uh, and occasionally you could see the path that that person took, right? Correct. But sometimes you couldn't always see the path, right? Correct. Whether Because it might have been on a hard surface and you didn't pick it up. Correct. There's no, for lack of a better term, trace of where it was, right? Correct. So based upon what you know, you don't know the exact footpath that somebody took, correct? That is correct. And you don't know whether the person, uh, if somebody walked down 430th Avenue towards the Sipple residence, if they took the first driveway in at the daughter of Don Sipple's or if they took the second driveway at Don Sipple's based upon physical evidence, agreed? Agreed. Uh, and so in that instance, it might be important to know whether or not those two houses connect each other. If somebody took the first driveway and then Nobody's home when they walk onto the second house. Sure. Okay. But you, you're not part of the investigation team. You're, you're there, for lack of a better term, kind of taking orders, right? Yes. Again, I mean, I, obviously you have some discretion and you exercise that, um, but you're, you don't know the details of the case, right? That is correct. You're, you're investigating what they tell you to investigate. Yes. All right. The maps that we have there, the four big blow-ups there, um, those are two-dimensional representations of that area, correct? Yes. As opposed to what we were seeing on the uh, screen there when you discussed uh, Exhibit 281, disc num uh, N, that's the three-dimensional depiction of it, correct? Correct. Um, and you talked about uh, the footprints. Is it, uh, I want to ask you some about those footprints again that were sure. on. Um, Evidence marker five that you showed. If you need to go to the computer, okay, uh, let me know. Um, you took measurements of those, correct? Correct. There, there were approximate measurements. Again, I can't tell where that impression starts and stops. And I don't think you'd said so. The uh, the approximate measurements you had of one was uh, 1.06 feet, correct? And the approximate measurement you had of the other one was 0 0.80 feet, correct? Correct. Um, and from that foot, those two footprints, you weren't able to determine whether it was a left foot or a right foot, were you? No. Um, but you could certainly, uh, you've seen the bottoms of shoes before, correct? Yes. Uh, you recognize the, the uh, four, four foot of the bottom of the shoe, the front of the shoe? Yes. As opposed to the heel of the shoe? Correct. Uh, and those prints that you observed uh, appeared to uh, the front of the foot was closer to the car, correct? Yes. And the heel was closer to the trailer. That is correct. So uh, assuming someone's walking in a normal fashion, the footprints were in a direction towards 
that open back door of the car, correct? It, it appeared that way, yes. And those were two footprints there that you saw, correct? Yes. And those are the only footprints in and around the car that you made note of, agreed? That I made note of, yes. Okay. Are you aware of anybody else making note of some other footprints? I don't believe so. Okay. And so again, you're following, there's a whole crime scene out, uh, in, a group of crime scene investigators out there, correct? Correct. You're all, I imagine, helping each other out. Yes. Hey, did you see this? Hey, did you see that? And kind of that's how it went. Um, yeah. Generally, um, when investigators are identifying their evidence, I let them do what they need to do. They place their evidence markers down. They say, this is the evidence that we found. Um, could you please go ahead, go through and document it? But you as a trained and experienced law enforcement officer, if you saw something that caught your eye and you saw that there wasn't a marker, you'd certainly point that out to the other professionals that are there. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so again, in that sense, it's a team approach very much, right? Yes. Want to make sure at that point you're documenting anything and everything. Correct. You don't know what is or what isn't important, right? That is correct. You just want to capture it accurately as you can. Yes. And you captured those two footprints going into the back seat of the car. They were in the 3D scan, yes. <clears throat> you, there was uh, some discussion about some blood being on the ground there, right? Yes. Um, obviously, you don't know, uh, based upon your seen evidence evaluation, you don't know when that blood got there on the ground. That Please. is correct. So the footprints, I want to ask you, well, just Well, before I get to the footprints, I want to talk to you about Exhibit 280 and the uh, path of the tracks. Is that all right? Okay. Can you, uh, how do you want me to set this up here? Officer, if, um, wherever you're comfortable, I, is it okay if you stand and I ask you questions while you stand? Absolutely. Can you see that? I can see it fine. It's very clear. All right. Um, so I want to ask you questions about this portion of it over here. Um, first off, I guess on the, what do we call this? The right or the left side, orientation-wise? Which way do we look at it? Why? I would say it's, um, the north arrow to the top. I would say it would be towards the east of the diagram. Okay. So on the east side of the diagram, there's this brown uh, line, correct? Correct. And that documents the muddy road slash driveway, whatever we want to call it, right? Yes. You call it a roadway? Road access point. Um, I don't believe there was an address associated with it. It was just some type of access from off the road. Okay. So can we agree to call it the muddy road? Sure. All right. So this brown mark here on the east side marks the muddy road, right? Yes. And as you're going north is top? Yes. South is bottom? Correct. So if a vehicle was traveling from the north to the south, um, there is a incline that goes to about where the uh, 658 mark is. Is that right? That is correct. And then after you get to the top of that incline, as you go further south, you're going down the other side of the incline. Is that right? Uh, it's pretty much level off to the top of that. We can actually see that in the 3D diagram. Okay. But the, would this be the, uh, north, the north half of the muddy road, we would agree, is an incline from north to south. That is correct. And the uh, bottom portion of that uh, then is either flat or a slight decline. Yes. All right. Um, and I think I know, but I want to ask you, it's not a trick question, where's the sun in the day during this time? What would get sun exposure and what wouldn't get sun exposure? Um, well, being in March, obviously the sun's, you know, the way the sun goes. Um, the Obviously, the sign, the northern half of the road would get less sun as it's facing away. Sun would be more towards the south, obviously, in the wintertime. Uh, so that the top portion of the southern portion of the road would receive more sun. The, the portion below 658 would receive more sun, in your opinion, right? In my opinion, yes. 
and obviously when you were there, it's late March in Wisconsin, right? Yes. The weather changes daily, if not hourly there, correct? Correct. You can have a, a big warm up and things start to thaw out, right? Yes. And you can have a freeze and all of a sudden all the surfaces get hard again, correct? Correct. So it very much depends upon the day. Yes. Especially in late March. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. <laughs> um, so you would agree that initially this portion of the road, uh, the north side of the road, would more than likely be a harder surface than the south side because it had less exposure to the sun. Agreed? Generally. Um, and we see here that on the south part of the road that there's some tire tracks that appear to go off the road. Is that right? That is correct. Um, you've driven in mud before, I would imagine? Yes. When you've driven in mud, you try to find the hardest surface, right? Yes. Um, so it would make sense to you that if someone's stuck in the mud, they might try to go to a harder surface like the grass. Agreed? It's possible, yes. And you had testified before, I believe, that uh, the area around the car, the grass was a much harder surface than the mud. Correct. All right. So that would be consistent with uh, your observations of the scene, right? Yes. All right. Um, did you note uh, this portion here where, the, where there's tracks leading from the mud road onto the grass, are there any photos or observations that you made of that muddy portion of it? Um, I didn't take any photographs. I did note that the area was um, quite muddy and quite disturbed. Um, it was difficult to determine um, if any tire marks had come off of the, well, as we're calling it, the muddy road, um, where I was able to definitively sh um, see where the tire marks were is when it became off of the muddy road. Okay. Um, so you could deduce that the vehicle in question was probably on the muddy road and then eventually left the muddy road where the tracks come off onto the grass. Is that right? Yes. That would be your conclusion? Yes. Um, and it appears as if when it initially got off the grass, there was again some maneuvering to try to make sure it continued in a forward motion? Yes. Uh, and then it managed to do so for some time? Yes. And then it got into a softer surface? Yes. That would be your observations? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when your observations of the vehicle at its resting point is, it appeared stuck in the mud? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Do you know anything about the timing of when the vehicle was there and when people were at other places? No. All right. Would you agree that the portion of the roadway that is exposed, uh, the northern portion of the muddy roadway, would be softer in the afternoon when the sun is shining on it than it would have been earlier in the day? That would make sense, yes. OK. Um, and what we see is a footpath here on exhibit 283 on the northern portion of that muddy road. Is that right? Correct. And then it appears to, at least using your deduction skills, come from the grassy area then onto the footpath. Is that or onto the muddy road, correct? Yes. And then at some point that footpath ends in the middle of the muddy road? It's just I wasn't able to discern any more um, areas where footprints could be observed. Okay, and was that due to the hard surface of the area or just so much uh, water and mud and Could've disturbance? A combination of both. There was water um, at the end of the driveway itself near 430th Avenue. Okay, and so for whatever reason, you just could not, you could no longer determine whether those were footprints or not, right? Correct. The footprints that are marked here on the footpath, those appeared to be from stocking feet or bare feet? I could not tell that. I just, it was a path of footprints. And on what we know from exhibit 284 is those, there was some foot, there were some casings done at E1 and E2, is that right? To my knowledge. Is that what you called them? Yes, foot cast impressions. Foot cast impressions, thank you. Okay, and so we'd have to look at those foot cast impressions to determine whether or not it was a shoe-worn footprint or a non-shoe-wearing footprint, right? Correct, and that is outside of my expertise. Okay.
that's all for now on these. I think you can have a seat. Okay. Thank you. So you testified about the lack of. I want to ask questions now about around the the scene, which I think perhaps best we can just. Exhibit 285, can you see that, sir? Yes. All right, so I want to ask questions about the general area of where the car was stuck in the mud, okay? Okay. Um, can you just again, top is north? Yes. Bottom south? Correct. So that makes that? West. All right, I'm always worried I'm going to make, mix that up. So on the east side of the car, also on the driver's side of the car, is where there were the two footprints that we previously discussed and you'd measured, is that right? Correct. And that's somewhere in the area of E5, is that right? That is correct. That would be consistent with the marker that you'd seen there, right? Yes. And that ends up to this uh, point closest to, arguably closest to the door other than the boot that we see there? Correct. Okay. And that's the only footprint that you you made observations of anywhere around the vehicle. That is correct. Now, doesn't mean that people weren't there walking around prior to your arrival. It just means you did not observe any footprints, right? Correct. And the lack of footprints has much to do with the surface, right? Yes. Right. And yes. so. Despite that you were able to see some footprints in the surface there, somebody could have been walking in the area near there, but the surface changes from foot to foot. It can, yes. Um, and so then all of a sudden the same person walking, you just can't observe the footprint then. Correct. Um, so whether or not there's footprints in the front of the vehicle doesn't mean people were or were not wandering around the front of the vehicle. Correct. Same with on the passenger side of the vehicle. That is correct. Same with the rear side of the vehicle. Correct. Same with around the green trailer. Correct. Same with the area in front of the, uh, in between the car and the trailer in front of the driver's door. Correct. Same with uh, in the area around E15 and E12 here uh, on the green trailer, right? Correct. So you can just say what you did see, correct? Yes. Um, you can obviously say what you didn't see. Yes. But there's less conclusions you can make about things that you were not able to observe. Agreed? Correct. Those are the only questions I have. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Any redirect? Mr. Yes. Uh, Trooper, when you're doing your mapping, are you mapping every, when you do the maps that we see with the total station, are you mapping everything that's at the scene or only certain things? Um, I try to get as much as possible. Um, you can get too much. Um, there are some things that just, you know, aren't necessarily important or um, obvious to investigators. Um, but anything that's identified by investigators is obviously clearly marked. Um, any type of geographical uh, markers, um, large trees, uh, telephone poles, um, anything out of the ordinary will generally tend to mark those because those will stand out. Um, but as far as um, trying to get everything, that's almost an impossible task. All right. And uh, when you're using the 3D scanner itself, uh, well, actually, first, with the total station, does it matter if it's night or day when you're using the total station? No, it could be night, day, rain, sun, um, with this particular unit. All right. And with the 3D scanner, for the, for the scanner part of it, does it matter whether it's night or day? It doesn't, um, other than at night we have to use supplemental lighting in order for the photographs to show up. All right. So the scanner itself that's scanning all these points will scan whether it's pitch black or uh, high noon in the middle of summer. Correct, and in this particular unit, um, the 330 stands for a range of 330 meters, or which is just over 1,000 feet. So that is about 1,000 feet is about the limit, far limits of this particular unit's range. All right, 
and uh, but the photographs you need to use supplemental light. Yes. All right. So if you're just using the grayscale part, which is just pretty much just the scanner, that's going to be the same whether it's night, day, or whatever. Correct. All right. And the photographs, you add light so that those show up a little bit better. Correct. Okay. The footprints that you observed in your scanning, uh, were those marked as evidence markers? Yes. Okay. The scanner itself, will it show uh, everything, uh, whether it's marked as an evidence marker or not? If the unit can basically see it, it will grab what it can, yes. Okay. So it'll show the image of it, whether it's marked as an evidence marker or not. Correct. And are there times when you see things on the scanner that become important that maybe were not noticed when you were initially at the scene? It can happen, yes. I don't have any other uh, redirect. Thank you. Can you request? Um, yes. Can I? Can we approach? Yes. Ask you the first round some questions about the gold article of clothing on the ground near the doorway. Okay. Uh, doorway of the vehicle. Yes. Okay. Um, maybe the vest. Could could you come down and pull Absolutely. that up just so we we all know what we're talking about? You're going to be uh, pulling it up on exhibit number 281, CDN. All right, thank you. Um, and you can actually go, I think it's probably easier for all of us to hear you up there. I'm not going to ask you to manipulate it anymore. Okay. Okay, so on the screen is the. Uh, ground on the driver's side of the vehicle. Is that right? That is correct. And we see in there uh, evidence marker four to indicate uh, the right boot. Is that right? I believe that's what it was indicating. Uh, evidence marker five, which is one of the uh, footprints leading towards that open door. Yes. And evidence marker six, which is a blood stain half on the ground, half on a dark blanket. That's what it appears to be? Yes. Somebody else will be here to correct us if we're wrong? Yes. Um, and so, and then we see the open doorway. Yes. Um, on the ground, on, on top of the ground, there's this big dark, what appears to be a blanket? If you're referring to the blue object under number six, yes. Yes, okay. I, I didn't know if it was, we'll yeah. call it dark blue. Is that All right? right, that's fine. And then next to that, or on top of that is I believe what was called a gold sweater. Is that right? Or it's a, something wrapped in the blanket. Okay. You don't know what that is. That is correct. You didn't pick it up. No. You did not collect that. No. Okay. Um, it was there at the scene when you got there, correct? Correct. When you got there at the scene, Ms. McCandless wasn't there, correct? Correct. You don't know what she was wearing on her person when she, uh, met with the, Farmer Police Hospital on March 22nd, agreed? Correct. And so anything, obviously, that would be on her person wouldn't be still at the scene, right? Correct. Okay. All you're observing is there's some gold piece of cloth that's there at the, at the scene, right? That is correct. But you don't know what it is? Correct. All right. Those were the only follow-up questions I had. Thank you. All right. Again, uh, Mr. Dufour. Sorry. Uh, Mr. DeFore, do you have uh, any redirect based upon that cross, given that was? No, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Trooper DeVries. You may step down. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a short break before uh, we uh, take up the next witness. So uh, we'll uh, excuse you to the jury room. All rise, please. Okay. Um, Mr. Nelson, you indicated that you had some matters you wanted to take up regarding uh, Ms. Hoffmeyer before she's called as a witness. Yes, Judge. Uh, I've been handed plaintiff exhibit number 519, a copy. I'll hand a copy to your honor so you know what we're referring to. It's a photo 
We're not objecting on foundation grounds. I understand that it's a photo of a letter that was found uh, in, I think, the trunk of the vehicle uh, in question. Um, we're objecting to the admissibility of the contents of that photo as it's hearsay. Um, it's a letter written by somebody to, I think, somebody else other than Ms. McCandless, and I it's hearsay, it's also irrelevant. It has no relevance whatsoever to anything of the case, so. All right, well, before uh, we go any further, does the, uh, what is the state's position with respect to Exhibit 519? Thank you, Judge. The, the purpose for bringing it in through Katie Hoffmeyer is that it was that she's the person who can say where it was located, which uh, is correct. It was found in the vehicle when she did her inventory of the items that were located in the vehicle when it was found in the farm and then taken to the Wausau Crime Lab. The content will come in. The background there is that this is a letter drafted by Jenna Van de Zand. Hi. Jenna Van de Zand, and she gave this letter to Jason Mengel on March 19th, 2018, so just a couple days prior to Mr. Woodworth's death. Uh, this came after a conversation she had with the defendant. So the content isn't really important to come in through Katie Hoffmeyer. That will be brought in later through Jenna, um, her testimony. It's entirely relevant to the defendant's state of mind and the information that was relayed about a conversation that the defendant and Jenna had to Mr. Mengel and the entirety of that relationship between the defendant, Mr. Mengel, and then how that worked with Alex Woodworth and John Hansen, those three things kind of coming together all at the same time um, is why this is relevant not only to state of mind but also to uh, this testimony of of Jenna Van de Zand about what information she relayed to Jason Mengel about her conversation with Ezra McCandless. So it's multiple layers of hearsay. It's right. irrelevant. Okay, I, I understand that the uh, defense position at this point, but really I think that argument then related to the contents of the letter uh, would really be more appropriate before Ms. Van de Zand testifies. Um, and uh, but for purposes of, I guess, uh, where it is located, when it's located, and so forth, uh, without it being published to the jury in terms of what it is for its content, um, I guess I don't see that as an issue for Ms. Hoffmeyer at this point in time. Again, as long as the jury doesn't see the contents of Exhibit 519. The defense respectfully disagrees. If it's irrelevant, it's irrelevant. If it's not eventually proved up to be relevant by Jenna Van de Zand, then it's not relevant for Ms. Hoffmeyer. There's all kinds of things that I imagine that they found. We don't need to go through the list of the Tic Tacs that were in the car, the list of, I mean, it's, it's not relevant at this point. If at some point we want to, I will agree to the foundation and we can take that up with Ms. Van de Zand, but I don't want it marked, I don't want it shown, it's not relevant, I don't think they've made an offer of proof to show that it's relevant at this moment in time. I don't think we need to bring back Ms. Hoffmeyer. My objections in front of Ms. Van de Zand are going to be for the relevancy issues, the foundation that it was found someplace in the car on this date. We will agree to that. But it doesn't need to be marked and put in to, in front of with the jury with Ms. Hoffmeyer. Why don't you give me a moment to read the letter? Briefly, yes. I believe there's reference to an Alex in that letter, and if your honor doesn't know yet or might not recall, there's an Alex Zink involved in this case. And so the Alex referenced in that letter, it's a defense position that it is not Alex Woodworth, which again makes questions the probative value of the letter. Judge, I don't see a reference to Alex and I didn't have the letter in front of me, so fair enough. I, I didn't see it, it, so I'm going through a second time to see if I missed it. Uh, I don't see any reference to an Alex. Um, and uh, 
So what is the state's position if there's a stipulation that there would be foundation as to when and where it was found and by whom when we get to the witness that authored the letter? My preference is just to have it identified as an exhibit, not published to the jury. Then it's cleaner. I understand the defense position. It's not a huge issue for us one way or the other, but I think my preference is to bring it in through, have it marked as an exhibit, have it be identified as where it was located, and then not published to the jury until, <coughs> unless and until Ms. Van de Zand can establish relevance to this case. All right, well, uh, I'm, I'm gonna allow the state to offer that evidence that it, this is found, won't be published to the jury, they won't be told what it is, um, and uh, we'll take up the actual admissibility of the content of the letter at a later time. So it's marked but not being offered and therefore not being received with this witness? That's my understanding. It would just be uh, identified as to, you know, where it was found, when it was found, by whom it was found. And, uh, you know, when it's tied up, if, there's, if there is relevance, uh, you know, then if it's offered, we'll argue on whether it will be received or allow you to argue whether it can be received at a later time. Okay. I understand. I just wanted to, so I, hopefully I don't just need to object during it. And so if that all goes smoothly, I won't, all right. but well, it's preserved. I tell you what, we'll, your, your objection <coughs> will be preserved as noted here on the record. And if, then if you don't want to object in front of the jury, um, that's fine. Your objection will be preserved. Okay. And Thank I'm you. assuming you're going to object when we get to the other witness. So yes, we'll need to take it up before that witness. Okay. Or maybe and, uh, so that. where, where was exhibit 519? So we Put it back where it was. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, and I just wanted to just make a note about our sidebar <coughs> at 9.38. Essentially, Mr. Nelson was asking whether the state would object to him going beyond the scope of redirect in, uh, in a recross. And uh, Mr. DeFore did not object. And so uh, Mr. Nelson was allowed to go beyond the, uh, the scope of redirect with the last witness, Mr. Trooper DeVries. Okay, um, does anybody need a restroom break? Uh, Ms. McCandless? Yes. So why don't we take care of that right now before we bring the jury back in? Be about five minutes.